So here's a question for you folks. In our polarized society, indeed across the country, is anyone still persuadable? Hmm. Because the lifeblood of any free society is persuasion, right? Changing other people's minds in order to change things that need to be changed and to bring about, hopefully, something a little bit better. But right now in America, we're suffering a crisis of faith in persuasion. And I think is putting our democracy, and some would even say the planet itself, at risk. Well, I know a certain someone who would probably say that. And that is my guest today, Anand Giridatis. He is a best-selling author, MSNBC political analyst, and was a foreign correspondent and columnist for the New York Times for more than a decade. He's the author of a new book entitled The Persuaders, at the front lines of the fight for hearts, minds, and democracy. Anand joins us on the Michael Steele podcast right after this. I say welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't really get into it too much in the intro, but one thing about this brother is that he and I have had the chance to dance occasionally on MSNBC and in other venues, and it's just great to settle down and have him in the house for a little conversation about his new book, uh, Persuaders. Uh, excited to talk to you about this, Anand. Welcome, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So so the, the, there are a lot of different approaches and angles that people can take with books. And one of the things that I love about this um, is in the face of everything else that's going on out there, particularly in, the, in, in democratic quarters, you are unabashed in your um, argument of, uh, of a persuasive agenda broadly speaking, a, a persuasive, uh, progressive agenda, uh, narrowly speaking. What, what is it that you're seeing out there uh, that this book feeds into and that the book itself helps affirm? I love that question. You know, I think this book is, my, my, my book before this one, my third book, Winners Take All, was a work of criticism of the billionaire, a kind of predatory billionaire class. And it was a book of real, I think, strong criticism of a small group of people doing what I felt was harm to the to the commons. This book is different. This book mm -hmm. is a loving intervention. Yeah, you know, <laughs> loving intervention true, yeah. with with family members, right? And 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 I'm sure you, Michael, have have had those conversations in your in your family and friend circles. I've had them in mine. This well, is actually, a book just a quick side note on that. The book that I wrote uh, before I became chairman. Um, was called right now was exactly that kind of book because we lost in 06, we lost in 08 to Obama. And so I was like, guys, let's get our act together to go out and defeat this agenda by Bo Obama along policy lines. But we have to know what it is we stand for first. And that's kind of how you approach Democrats yes. and progressives. That's exactly right. So so he, let me tell you what I what I saw, which is as you know, and 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 you've been vocal about this on in television when we've been there together, the the, the issue in American life is no longer thirty one point whatever marginal tax rate versus thirty nine marginal tax rate, or this kind of healthcare delivery channel versus that kind of healthcare delivery channel. We no longer have the luxury of of having a political argument where those are the issues and those are the stakes. Right. The stakes at this point are really continued and expanded liberal democracy on the one hand, and a road to kind of fascism and political violence and elections being overthrown mm -hmm. um, as the other road, right? That's the contest. And when I look at that contest as it's been waged, as you and I discuss it on television often, I see, frankly, a pro-democracy movement broadly that is struggling to win. And- yeah. And here's the thing, because there is so much rigging going on by the modern Republican Party, voter suppression, these, you know, Steve Bannon's legion of state election board people fiddling with the switch, you know, uh, gerrymandering the Senate's natural 
amplification of a, of an aging white mm-hmm. minority. Uh, you know, all these electoral college, these structural things, kind of unfair things. I think it has let Democrats and and folks in the pro democracy movement more generally tell themselves that they're struggling to win because of unfair play. And the loving intervention of this book says, hey guys, I think the pro-democracy cause may be losing because it's actually straight up being outcompeted. I, I think the political offering it is offering is 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 being outgunned, mm-hmm. even in a fair fight, if we had one, uh, <laughs> by the other offering. Right. And and the right. evidence for that, Michael, is is polling. I mean, as you know. There's, there's no gerrymandering in polling. I mean, there's no electoral college right. in polling. Right. Right. And polling is you just calling people on the phone. Right. As you know, most Republican candidates for Congress at this point uh, are election deniers. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the growing number of folks uh, on the right who openly advocate forms of violence as normal political behavior. Right. And we are going to the American people and we're placing these polling phone calls. And consistently, 40 to 46 to 49, whatever percent of Americans are saying, yeah, I prefer that to continue to an expanded liberal democracy. And so I look at that, Michael, and I say, we don't just have a rigging problem, although we do have one. We have a real public opinion problem. The the struggle for democracy is not winning hearts and minds right now. And it's the same thing in Brazil. And it's the same thing in India, right? You can't, yeah, the Electoral just, College does not explain India, right? There's something is happening around the world where people who want freedom and voting and human rights as the center of their program are not winning hearts and minds. And I, I wrote a book to try to understand why that is and figure out how they can change that. No, you, you, you make a very excellent point there because you look at what just happened in Italy. For example, I mean, they've gone, they've gone full MAGA, if you will, uh, in the election of their new president there. Um, and so there has been this, it's not just unique to Europe or unique to the US. It, it's a global phenomenon that is 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 hitting all, all parts of the globe in the sense that it begs the question. So what are people, how do people look at democracy or more importantly, how have they come off of democracy so readily? After what history, I mean, just the last 75 years of history um, have shown us um, what what we saw during World War II, what we saw during World War I, what we saw seen in other parts um, at history where author- authoritarian type leaders assert themselves. How do we continue to fall into this trap and believe that this thing called democracy yeah, it's okay, but it ain't all that. And I can just move off of it just as quickly as I can stay with it. Yeah, I think that's such a great question. And and I, one way that I think about it, I think we're often so siloed in our one country that, that we miss these factors that are happening in multiple, right? I was a foreign correspondent in India for the New York Times for many years before here. And my family originally came from India. So I have that perspective, totally different situation. You don't have a you know history of white supremacy. You don't have a history of right. slavery. You don't have uh, the Senate in India. But like at some very deep political emotion level, there's some very similar things happening, right? So let me let me give you my my theory, which has to do with the sheer amount of change that people have lived through in your and my lifetimes pretty much everywhere, and certainly in this country, certainly in India, certainly in Brazil. And I'm talking about, just step back for a second. If you were to, if you were to just take the technological revolution of our lifetime alone, mm-hmm. no other big changes, right? That is like a right. tsunami, tsunami. It, nothing has been left you know, untouched by that. Everything is different because of that. Everybody's job is different. Everybody's education is different. Everybody's way of learning about consuming information is different. That's just the tech revolution, right? In this same period, we did the rise of China, right? We chose to trade with China. That has left nothing unchanged. Every, like every man who used to make stuff in this country, right? Not only was his job maybe put at risk in the early 2000s, but his understanding of his masculinity and his place in a community was like wiped out very quickly with frankly, not that much forethought by policymakers. 
OK, in that same period of time, we've had a gender revolution mm -hmm. where a role roles that women were kind of stuck in historically for thousands, thousands, and thousands of years were fully upended in a 10, 20, 30, 40 year period. Very happily. I'm very mm -hmm. glad that that happened. But again, a lot of very sudden change in people's structures of life, self-understanding, all kinds of things. Right. Then you talk about progress on race in this country, progress on race, demographic change, right? People, people's towns look very different than they looked before. Right. People's people now have to uh, learn to live with people. They didn't even of kinds. They didn't even know growing up again. I'm very happy for that personally. I'm sure you are too, but, but it's a lot. And I could go on. And so my, and, and a lot of this has happened in a lot of places, not all of it everywhere, but my understanding is that when you have in history periods of this much upheaval, not as some abstract thing that's happening in the newspaper, but who you are is changing, how you conceive of yourself is changing, how you relate to other people is changing, right. whether you have other people to relate to is changing, the basic shape of your life, sources of your esteem and meaning are quickly pulled out from you. And often the replacement is not yet in the mail. It is, a vacuum, a an emotional, psychological, moral vacuum. And my basic thesis to you, Michael, would be the, the, the extremist right and increasingly a kind of fascistic and nationalistic authoritarian right has rushed into that vacuum, has understood that vacuum, has understood the anxieties, the fears, the lack of a sense of self, the lost ways of being that haven't been replaced yet, and has essentially built a politics on top of those anxieties, mm -hmm. almost backing the truck of their offerings into those anxieties. But I would almost say the, the, the right is starting with those anxieties. And broadly speaking, the pro-democracy cause that I, am, that I am lovingly intervening with here, I think has offered policy in this era. It's offered facts and figures and spreadsheets. It's offered good ideas in a technocratic sense. But broadly speaking, it has failed to deliver material help uh, of the kind that people need in eras of change like this. And it has failed to offer psychic support so, for these transitions. So now that goes to the heart of the book. It goes to the the, the thesis, the basis, the title, persuaders. It, it's how you make that persuasive argument. It is easy to persuade you when you're fearful, right? If you're afraid of others, if you're afraid of your own economic or social status or, or situation or condition, if you are afraid of what the future may hold for you or may not hold for you, especially your children. So it's easier for that body politic to evolve around and, and, and mature those fears in a way that you, we see playing out now. The case you make in Persuaders is, is and as you just said, you know, yeah, we've talked about policy. We've talked about the technocratic aspects of it, and we can give you the data and we can share with you the ideas, but none of that gets to the heart of persuading people that the approach that a, a more progressive democracy versus an entrenched uh, autocratic um uh conservative democracy or would 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 give you um people just aren't buying it what is it you think can be done to change those minds how do you go about changing those minds and this gets into the book who are the persuaders that you see best positioned to do that to make the case in a way that two, three, four cycles from now, not only have has the level, the, the playing field been re-leveled, right? But the, the parity is such that we're back into the debates around big policy ideas, small policy ideas, and and this the the sense of fear about all of that is dissipated. Yeah. So let me let me let me answer each of those in a in a certain way. First of all, let me say the cross-cutting lessons I learned from these persuaders first, and then let me tell you about some of them. 
you know, I was not interested in my last book. I wrote a lot about policy and the, mm -hmm. and the obstruction of good policy. And I'm still a believer in those things as the fundamental thing we have to do. Right. This book is about how we get to policy because you can't get to policy if you can't move people to your cause. And so this this book is taking one step back in the process. And I, I wrote about a lot of different types of persuaders, activists, organizers, elected officials, uh, messaging consultants, mm -hmm. a cult deprogrammer, because you know you got that QAnon problem to deal with, and, and so on and so forth. But here's some of the cross-cutting lessons that I think a vigorous, muscular, intelligent pro-democracy movement, activities it would be doing to win people that it's not doing now. Um, commanding attention, right? Attention is extremely important, particularly in a fragmented landscape. And the, and the far right has shown a really good knack, right? I mean, who better yeah. than Donald Trump, right? Yeah. Uh, just being, being able, and I would define attention as like being able to make a large continental republic talk about something for five minutes or one day is an incredibly important skill. AOC's got it, right? N not a lot of Democrats have it. It's mm -hmm. vital, right? And, and you see like Joe Biden, it's such an easy layup for Joe Biden to do fireside chats. Like why, ha why aren't there fireside chats on TikTok, YouTube, Friday, 4 p.m., right? Just like basic stuff where you're like, are you all, are, are you all even like attempting to signal jam the conversation, right? Um, I, I literally had that conversation five minutes before coming, coming on the podcast with you. Literally had that very same conversation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Second, I would say a, a term I learned from a lot of organizers, which is meaning making. So if you work in traditional elective politics, as you know, you're really asking for two things most of the time. You're asking for money and you're asking for votes, right? And both of those are relatively infrequent things. Money, maybe a few times a year, vote every couple of years. Well, that leaves 99.9% .9 of people's time, you know, unaddressed. And what organizers talk about is real political consciousness is what is forming in that other 99.9% .9 of the time. And if a party is only really asking you for money and for your vote and just leaving you alone, that 99.9% .9 of the time, the party is not present in your life. Right. When you are going from the stimuli in your life to the stance that you may eventually form. So a couple examples, like you notice there's more Spanish speaking people at the drugstores in your town, right? Mm -hmm. People don't, Everyone experiences that at some point or another, some version of that. People don't on their own go from that to I want to become a militia man, you know, <laughs> fighting the uh, southern invasion by the aliens caravan on the border. that's coming up the Correct. from the border. Right. So what is the ladder, Michael, that takes you from the Walgreens cashier observation to like a 10 of like right. militia man, it's a meaning making apparatus. The right has again, very elaborately developed Tucker. That's what Tucker is doing. That's perpetuated what doing. by a uh, compliant and complicit media. Correct. And basically the left obviously doesn't have that. And it's, it's kind of good. I mean, I'm, I'm very glad that MSNBC is not a, you know, is not a mirror image of Fox news, but I think we need to think about what is the counter to that, right? When right. people are seeing those stimuli, what stories are we telling them? You know, people's kids coming home and saying, you know, I learned that America is like a has like a flaws in its founding, right? It, liberals kids are coming home and saying that conservatives kids are coming home and saying that that's right. just happening, right? That's a that's a real thing that is happening in the culture. Now, the right has a fully baked meaning making apparatus to tell you why that's happening. CRT, George Soros, they have a whole story. Do we have a story? No. To counter that? <laughs> no. It, like your kid is coming home and saying that. Right. That's happening. You don't we, we Joe Biden can't stop your kid from coming home and saying that. So so Joe Biden and others are either counter explaining that or they're just letting the other side own yeah. the frame in your mind for why that's happening. Right. right. Um, meeting people where they are is the third point, I would say, which is these organizers talk about, you know, really being more open as a movement to people who don't fully get it. Mm -hmm. That means people whose hearts are in the right place, but use the wrong terms on on race or on LGBT rights, pull them in uh, while being totally harsh on people who actually want to, you know, degrade and exterminate people, which is a different issue that needs to be dealt with differently. But people who are awkward, we need mm -hmm. the awkward in our movements. We don't want to make the awkward feel like they should go to the other side. Um, and I think meeting people where they are also, and you've talked about this on the shows that we're on, 
like when people are telling you they care about gas prices most, do not do this thing that Democrats do, which is like, yeah, hey, Bob, I hear you say gas prices are the most important. But actually, Bob, let me explain to you why that they're not. That's not actually the most important. And and this thing I got over here in my shirt, I'd like to sell you. This is the most important thing. Right. That is so true. I yes. mean, it's just like, what, like you don't explain This is like dem explaining. Like you don't you don't explain to voters why what they care about is in fact something they don't care about. It's so bizarre. About. Bob, you really don't care about it. Bob, you don't know yourself, Bob. God, you Bob, don't know yourself. Yeah. Bob, you need to go to therapy to acquire more self. Like, we're running against Bob, but like we need Bob's vote. It's like so bizarre. <laughs> and you know uh, what? You know what, Anand? And that's how Bob feel, feels. Yeah. He feels you're actually running against me. You don't give a rat's ass about how I feel right now. You're just trying to convince me <laughs> to get on board with your ish. And 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 like, by the way, the Democrats have a lot to say about why gas prices are the way they are and and what they're doing. To, you know, but you got to you got to say it. You can't just like you can't just demsplain that that people shouldn't care about the thing they care about. Right. right? Um, a couple more. You know, home belonging is a big concept in the book from these persuaders that I that I talked about. So again, the right has been very good at at really having a sense of belonging in the movement, having kind of a transcendent fervor, having right. having you know exuberance. Um, I think this is something broadly speaking, Democrats don't really think about, are not particularly interested in. Um, you know, my wife is a an expert on on gathering and belonging. She wrote a, a great book called The Art of Gathering. People call her from every institution in this country to have them figure out how to create more meaningful connection and belonging. Mm -hmm. Some of the only institutions to not really be interested in calling are <laughs> the ones standing between us and the apocalypse. I'm always fascinated by that. Right. Everybody, you know, I, I was speaking to actually to another you know, huge, incredibly like first name, famous uh, expert on creating belonging and connection. She said to me, she said, military, military organizations call me to do consulting for them. Companies call me music, but Democratic Party's never called. Right. And so like, why isn't there a positive counter to the Trump rally? <laughs> you telling me you telling me that that's the only guy in America who knows how to throw an exuberant rally that makes people feel something like you can't do that for good. You can't figure out a good virtuous version of that. I get these damn five dollar emails ten times a day. Oh Have I God. ever, <laughs> ever been invited anywhere to a physical location? Hey, Anand, Fort Greene Park, 2 p.m. Bring your favorite <laughs> musical instrument. Let's like get each other through the day in this stressful time. Right. Like, right. There's just no right. community. There's no actually community the democratic party is not an irl organization anymore it's it's a it's a fully extremely online community and it, that's not really a community uh, and finally i would say you know two things f uh, having a sense of fight being willing to pick fights yeah. uh you know and when you see beto do it when you see gavin newsom do it you know it, it looks good people like it uh, we need more of that um righteous fights not always having to go high when uh, go, go high when they go low it's okay to go low uh, for good. Um, and last story, narrative. Uh, I, I just think, broadly speaking, the pro-democracy movement is a facts and figures, technocratic, you know, let the let things speak for themselves, let policies mm -hmm. speak for themselves. Well, if you've ever actually met real people, you know, outside Cambridge, Massachusetts and, and Palo Alto, California and and Brooklyn, New York, and and, you know, a few other like you know, super zips of highly educated people where, you know, every other person's a has a graduate degree. Uh, most people operate on a more kind of emotive level. Uh, Democrats, you know, count among their supporters like 90 percent of the world's best, most accomplished storytellers in Hollywood. Um, I have met several of those people who, once again, are just like amazed that no one they know has ever had their skills tapped into. Right. No like they, 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 we, like the Democrats love Hollywood money. Like, I don't think the Democrats ever tap into Hollywood skills. Like these are people who know how to make people feel things. Right. right? And my friends who work in Hollywood are always complaining that they're always being asked for money and they've never been asked for their insight. Right. And and so the, so I would say attention, meaning making meet people where they are, home, fight, story. That that to me is the agenda for a pro-democracy movement that can win, can thrive, and can bury this fascist movement in the garbage dump of history. So you start, you, 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 
very early in the book start framing those those characteristics qualities points um when you you start profiling the people who are um or can be architects of that narrative uh for example i pulled one uh, a number but one i'll start with is loretta ross um, who says, quote, I think the 90 percenters spend too much time trying to turn people into 100 percenters, which is totally unnecessary. Ross was speaking of those who say things like, if you're not working on my issue uh, from my angle, then you're erasing my issue. If you're championing uh, economic justice, you're problematic for minimizing race. If you're championing uh, racial justice, you don't post enough about the ills of capitalism. If you're focused on long-term climate change, you're neglecting the here and now needs of poor communities. That sentiment that Ross, that Loretta Ross expressed, which is how you really sort of frame this part of our discussion, is a real thing in how Americans look at Democrats and Republicans. And when they look at Democrats, there always seems to be an excuse for why you can't get on board with what I'm feeling right now. So if I'm telling you that, you know, um, you know, this is the angle of my issue, your comeback is, well, you're on the wrong angle. And, and right. so how do you, how do you begin to overcome that? Do you push forward the Loretta Rosses of the world? Do you make them much more the focus and move off of the political paradigm such as it's constructed? Again, before coming on this, I was having this conversation with some strategists talking about how we reframe narratives on the right. I mean, there are a lot of conservatives like myself who would love to go back on MSNBC and go head to head with Anon on big policy, which we were doing long before Trump showed up, right? But we can't do that now because we've got to reorient the democracy towards core values and principles and the structures that keep this shit running. Do we, what do we do with the Loretta Rosses of the world and the people that you profile in the book? How do they become more important than the clearly lackluster, unimaginative responses that we get from our political parties on one side or the hyper-aggressive in your face, we're coming after you responses we get from the other? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, this is my fourth book. And I think <laughs> writing four books over the last decade, I have learned a lot about what books cannot do right. and what books can do. And I think I've gotten sharper in my understanding of the book as a tool. And so, you know, a book is not going to, uh, you know, in and of itself change the way millions of people vote or anything like that. Mm -hmm. What a book can do is in an internal struggle within a group of people, right? Such as the pro-democracy movement writ large, thousands and thousands of influential people. I think a book like this can help people who are currently losing an argument internally mm -hmm. prevail in that argument. And it can, it can kind of strip some of the clothes of the, of the emperor off people who are currently winning an argument, but don't deserve to be. And so when I say this is an intervention, the Loretta Ross view of the world is something to use my own term in the book. I call it the orchestra principle, which is, I think we need to do much better as a pro-democracy side at saying, we play different instruments in this orchestra and we respect that different people play different instruments. And we're not going around saying, Michael, I'm an oboe player. Mm -hmm. Why are you playing the cello? Right. 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 And and while that's quite obvious in the context of an orchestra, my view of how political change happens is that it's an ecosystem that requires all kinds of efforts. So let's take climate change. Um, you know, and you and I may disagree on this, but like, I think there is a place, whether I would do that or not, I think it's right in any case. Or not, I think there is a place in an ecosystem of making change. If you think the planet is itself going to become uninhabitable in our mm -hmm. lifetimes, I think there is a place in that ecosystem for someone to throw tomato soup at a painting to make the whole world talk about something for a day. That may not be my angle, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think those people are, you know, 
to be scolded necessarily because they're not persuasive, because it's the whole ecosystem that needs to be persuasive. They're doing one piece of it, which is getting the whole world to talk about something for a day. As you know, as someone who's try- bought media and tried to, that's very hard. Right, <laughs> so, it's very hard to so, do. So there's value in, in provocation, getting people to talk. Then those kind of people might say, look at Joe Biden and say, you know, stodgy old, you know, moderate guy who's, you know, doing one tenth of the amount that that should have been spent. Well, the tomato soup people may not, for their part, be respecting that Joe Biden's job is to take something that a lot of Americans might have felt was like too much. And Joe Biden's a great reasonableizer. Right. Because he's a 78 year old white guy. Whatever he says, like turns to reasonable. Right. He's like the King Midas of reasonableness. <laughs> like he just says stuff. And then like Americans like can't think it's radical if Joe Biden is doing it. Right. right. That, that's right. his charm and his power. Right. So there's a role for that in the movement. There's a role for the tomato soup. There's a role for the 78 year old white guy who just who sneaks it through and makes you kind of feel like it's not that big a deal. There's a role for the AOC who's a bridge between those activists and and Joe Biden, who goes on the task force for Biden's campaign when a lot of activists said maybe she shouldn't. There's a role for, you know, uh, for the Sunrise Movement, youth confronting Nancy Pelosi. There's a role for businesses coming in and saying, we actually see this in our self-interest. Let us get in this conversation. Right. No one has the monopoly. And part of how you make change Mm -hmm. is saying, I actually understand that I have my lane, but multiple lanes may need to actually function here to be a persuasive movement overall. So then to on on that point, is there a role for Trump and Trumpism? Because, I mean, I don't, because, I, because the the change they're advocating, and I know well the the original the original origins of it uh, in sort of this constitutionalist Tea Party movement that began uh, probably back in two thousand four two thousand five, um, where it started to get its political moorings, but its orientation was formed back in the late eighties and early nineties with what Newt Gingrich and and others were doing in the House, culminating with the win in 94, and then sort of launching uh, from there, um, they would make the case under what you've just laid out. Yeah, we're we're making a political statement. We're, we're, We're advocating for a change in the direction of the country. I mean, there's no question they're advocating for a change in the direction of the country, the change they want. You know, I think the the context in which I view that movement, um, and I think it's really important to say this, is I think sometimes on the pro-democracy side, we give this far-right movement too much power in the Mm -hmm. sense that we describe them as the protagonists of the story. And we describe the pro-democracy side somehow as living in reaction to them. Right. Mm -hmm. And we and and we tell the story backwards. I think the way to tell the story is this country promised some extraordinary promises in the late 18th century. As you know, it lived up to some of them very well from the beginning and did not live up to others of them at all at the beginning. Right. And one way to understand its trajectory over 250 years is as an attempt to reconcile Mm -hmm. those things as an attempt to get better the way people try to get better, to become truer to itself, to become what it promised. And the part of the story we don't tell, Michael, is in the last 50 years in particular, 60 years, the amount of progress towards that kind of self-actualization of the promise Mm -hmm. of the words that Jefferson wrote, of the words in that constitution, the, the progress in recent decades has been extraordinary. We have gotten closer and closer to being what we, to having the courage to be what we said we'd be. Right. Right. And once you start the story that way, which is, by the way, a, a, an inspiring and, and galvanizing and hopeful reminder and true, then it becomes easy to say, that's why that progress forced a choice the Republican Party confronted about whether we should remain a kind of low taxes and deregulation Mm -hmm. focused party, or should we become the party of white 
and male grievance and resistance to change as the country becomes what it promises? Should we become a movement offering people an opportunity to break the republic instead of share it, right? And once you tell the story that way, you are very clear that this insurrection against America that is that movement right now, that insurrection, like, like they're living in our world. We're not living in their world, mm -hmm. right? Trumpism mm -hmm. is a barnacle on a future that is coming. It is a very big barnacle, mm -hmm. but, but it's a barnacle. It is a movement of reaction. It is literally reactionary. It is a movement of reaction. And I think to tell it that way is to, is to then remind yourself of what we can do. We need to defeat it by making the vision of the future that I just outlined more thrilling, more salient to people, more galvanizing, more inviting. Um, and I think it very much can be, but I don't think it's going to happen through policy advocacy, through holding you know policies to be self-evident, through praying for Trump to be indicted. All these things are detours. If you are not thinking about how to build a movement that is bigger, more fun, more exuberant, more transcendent, more uh, has more belonging, have, has more fire than their movement, you're losing. Everything else is irrelevant. Are you building a bigger, better movement than the Trumpism movement? All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're having a in very deep conversation with my brother Anand, Anand Giratis. Uh, we're going to come back and have some more uh, with Anand after this. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are keeping it live and keeping it real here at the Michael Steele Podcast, and so glad you could be a part of the conversation with us today. Uh, we are getting into the book, The Persuaders at the Front Lines of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and Democracy. Uh, it is authored by uh, Anand Giridatis, who is a best-selling author, MSNBC political analyst, and a buddy. So let's break it down a little bit more. We got big elections coming up. Let's take what we've just been talking about and apply it to the next two and a half weeks <laughs> because it's about to get real. This whole convergence of the battle between pro and anti-democratic interests uh, um, are beginning to uh, uh, play themselves out at the ballot box as voters are starting to vote. Early voting has started in many, many states uh, with more early voting to come. Um, what what are the, some of the ways you, you were just we were just talking about uh, creating this movement, creating this excitement around democracy? And, and what I really took note of in your description was you didn't tie it to a policy. You didn't tie it to a thing. Um, in particular. So it wasn't, or you got to be on board with, you know, climate change. You got to be on board with, you know, um, uh, you know, school vouchers or whatever program. You really tied it to something broader and, and, and probably more important at the end of the day. And that is how we view the country, how we view each other. Uh, what are some of the ways in which activists um, across the spectrum who align themselves with democracy, right? Uh, what, what are some of the ways that they can be, you know, the activists and the leaders can begin to reach those who may seem unreachable and bring them into this movement um, in an authentic way? Yeah, I mean, well, you talk about the midterm. So I think we should kind of separate what are things that can be done in the very short term versus what is the kind of rebuilding needs right. um, that, right. that, that need to happen, you know, for 2024. I still think in these, in these next few weeks, there is nothing stopping uh, better messaging. Uh, there just really needs to be a, a real uptick in messaging. One of the chapters in my book is called the art of messaging. And it's about mm -hmm. Anat Schenker Osorio, who you may know, who's, who, you know, is widely viewed as the Frank Luntz of the left you know, and I say in the book, the, except the only difference is the left doesn't listen to its Frank Luntz. Right. So it's, right. it's almost the same, except totally different. Um, and and well, can, not, can I can I reinforce your point there? Because I'm glad you said it's, it's great minds, because I had actually highlighted uh, the the Schenker or uh, or Osorio a point. If I could just read. Yeah, just of so course. We can Please fine tune it. You know, 
quote, between, uh, between immigrants contribute to our culture, we're all the better for having them here. And quote, we should put babies in cages. There is no in between, Shankar or uh, Oso, Oso, give me the name again. I can want to say Shankar Osorio. Thank you, uh, told me. That's an on and off switch. What we actually see for persuadables is that they toggle between competing views of the way the world works and whatever they hear repeated most frequently becomes common sense and what everybody thinks. The persuadables uh, she quoted courted were malleable and contained many fighting faiths in Oliver Wendell Holmes's famous phrase and were in a constant unresolved process of meaning making trying to of meaning making trying to alloy their uh, alloy their what they heard at work and on the news and from their friends into something solid like a worldview. So you have these people hearing all this stuff and trying to create something with it, which is really what uh, uh, Shankar Osorio was talking about. And she is she is such an incredible and brilliant person and a kind of firecracker. And she's on like a one woman insurgency to to flip the Democratic Party's theory of persuasion on its head. And she's making quite a bit of success, I would say, slowly but surely. And, and the flip is the following. I think for most of the Democratic parties, for much of the Democratic Party in, in, in recent years, the dominant approach to persuasion has been what I would call like the pizza burger theory, which is you sort of, your base wants pizza. You, mm -hmm. you kind of perceive moderates in the middle want, you know, uh, 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 burgers. So you just offer pizza burgers. And the problem is that your your base doesn't want a pizza burger and you're actually the moderates don't want a pizza burger. And now you've sold something that like no one no, wants. nobody wants. Right. Right. And and her theory of moderates is that moderates, first of all, you know, moderate implies kind of being in the middle or like the diluted averaged version of a thing. A not big insight, which is backed by a ton of data, is that a moderate is not an identity. It is a situation. It is a situation of being unresolved in in, in between like multiple moral frames, mm -hmm. right? Which is so so if I if I were to say to you, you know, do you think that and and you've done these conversations with voters, I'm sure. like if I were to say to you, do you think that on immigration, we should, you know, have a totally tight border and no one should be able to come in? Uh, you know, or do you think that, uh, you know, we should just have something like open borders. A moderate is not necessarily someone who wants the mean between those two positions. Right. A moderate is someone who could be susceptible to each of those ways of looking at the world, depending on the context, depending on what's happening in their lives, depending on whether they're feeling abundant or feeling scarce, depending on whether, you know, what is normative in their town. Right. Um, and, Anat therefore thinks about the job of persuasion as being how do you encircle persuadable people with an abundance of messages saying, this is the normal way to think, right? And the right, once again, knows how to do that. It knows how to surround you with these kinds of phrases and worldviews so that you just think, yeah, the normal way to think about this is X. And, and Democrats are worse at that because they often are trying to do outreach to this illusory middle and coming up with the kinds of cold, diluted policies that bore their own base to tears mm -hmm. and never actually get those moderates to, to not think they're a communist anyway. You know, so so there's a place, a Knott's version of persuasion for Democrats or prescription is kind of passion and conviction led persuasion not dilution-led persuasion. You would say they're not listening to that, though, in the main. The, 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 the main, main establishment is not. I think more and more of the movement spaces are. I think more and more of the activist spaces are. I think if you look at some of the most dynamic communicators on the left, like AOC, they're following that model broadly. I mean, there is a new is theory there, of communication, but... It, but it, I don't think it's the White Houses. I don't think it's, you know, Senate Democrats. No. Right. So for the AOCs, do you think there's a lesson to be learned in that in that theory of communication uh, that how you say something is equally, if not more important than what you say? In other words, um, 
we very readily branded AOC on the right, readily and quickly. Why? Because it was easy. <laughs> right? Because she threw up, she threw up a whole lot of stuff that it was easy to to target and go after. Um, in you know, which kind of boiled down to this sort of Green New Deal package. Um how how do, how do progressives um uh and, and the Democratic Party on the on the whole kind of rethink that that part of the messaging um so that those early traps that they used to fall into, and some would argue, like myself, they still fall into to some degree, um, can be avoided. And and you really, I mean, it's like in, it's like in any sport, when when your opponent knows the play before you do it, that begs you got to change up the play. You may want to you may want to show that's what you're going to do, but when you execute, they see something else. And when that when that linebacker moves up thinking you're going to do, you know, do a, a running play and okay, now baby, I actually plan to pass. So that's what we're, that's what we're going to do. How do you, how does that alignment or realignment inside of that communication structure uh, work itself out? I mean, let me, let me tell you, you, you will remember as, as will everyone listening to this, the dress. Do you remember when AOC wore that tax the rich dress? to yes. the Gala? Yes, okay? yes, So yes. I was watching that the same way everybody was. And I watched, first we watched the dress, right? Then you watch the reaction online. Now I would, here's how I would assess the reaction online. I would say most regular people loved it, thought it was interesting, just like, right. you know, peanut gallery. But then among more kind of politically committed people, there were several reactions. People on the right hated it because of alleged hypocrisy, right? She's saying tax the rich, but she's going to the Met Gala where it's, you know, very it nothing but the rich. <laughs> Correct. Right. Then there was a critique from moderates and centrists on the, you know, centrist Democrats, like, you know, she's this anti-corporate person, but she's, you know, then there was a far left critique that this is an empty gesture. There's real Black Lives Matter protesters getting arrested outside the Met Gala right now doing a real action against, you know, against police. She's in there just performatively gesturing and mingling with these rich people, right? Everybody from these different sides was like, and I was just sitting there watching this thing and being like, none of these people understand. This brilliant young woman got the whole United States of America to talk about her preferred three word phrase for 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And Michael, you know, mm -hmm. as someone who, who yeah. has, if, if you can do that, if you can do that, that's if you good. can do that in the early 21st century, that's holy good. shit, that's holy good. shit. If yeah. you as a 30 something young 30 year old woman, new member of Congress can get the whole United States of America agreeing with your phrase, disagreeing with your phrase, debating your phrase. I was walking by restaurants in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. People were talking about at the tables. I went to a dog costume parade a year ago this time. And the only costume repeated on multiple dogs was tax the wrist rich dresses, right? <laughs> that is a woman who understands how to, that the first step in shifting the narrative and getting something you want done is making everybody aware and talk about it and think about it, right? right? And I think what you need to have happen in a lot of these progressive and liberal spaces and democratic party, is to actually understand that if people are not even in your moral frame or talking about your issue, it doesn't matter what your issue is. And that means not only taking something like Build Back Better and selling it better, maybe through things like Fireside Chat, but it actually means changing what you propose, right? Like right. it maybe means not doing a Build Back Better and instead breaking it up into pieces and like having fights about insulin. And you know, that was one of the proposals that people were talking about, right? So should Build Back Better have been like, 10 perfectly crafted fights, mm -hmm. right? What, that you want to pick, right? And I think there's a, at some deep level, Democrats disdain that kind of thinking, provocation, picking fights as being like lower, like as being kind of base. Yeah, so let's expand that out because it really goes to, I think when you when you go through your book and you, you lay out these, these stories and, and you're sort of sharing how, you know, some of these activists and others have sort of 
um, pushed up against the status quo. What what are some of the tactics that that people have used to persuade others, and 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 why do some of these work while others don't? I mean, it, 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 because using the AOC thing, I would I would say I agree with a thousand percent with what you said. And and the interesting thing about it was I'm curious as if because AOC is as clever as on the left as uh, some of our folks are on the right in, in Trump world, Trump himself even, where he throws up a piece of meat that he knows all oh, the rabbit dogs are just going to go after it. I don't care. I don't care how much of it they nibble. I just want them to lunge for it, right? Um, how much of that whole episode plays itself out narratively for 48 hours if the right says, yeah, whatever? Well, I mean, I think and what it let does. It go. In other words, don't engage, don't don't take the bait as a form of tactic. Um, uh, and so, it really, kind of begs the question for me: What are some of those tactics then that we can begin to use to tactically draw people into conversations they otherwise would not be drawn into? Yeah. So, I, I, let me tell you about a uh, the experiment, remarkable experiment. Uh, that is happening uh, right now across this country called deep canvassing. And I chose to end this book with a chapter mm -hmm. about deep canvassing. And deep canvassing is exactly what, what you just asked in terms of having these conversations, right? So we talked a moment ago about provocation and attention and these things, right? But there's a whole other side of it, which is how do you lovingly pull people in to a, a worldview that may not be their worldview right now? Right. But that, but that you want to live in because you want your, you know, black or brown kids to be safe. You want everyone to feel included regardless of their background or orientation. Um, this movement of deep canvassing grew out of a stinging defeat in 2008 for gay marriage in California, Prop 8. And and some of these gay uh, campaigners, these these gay rights campaigners, many of them gay themselves, kind of woke up to the stinging realization that a lot of their neighbors in LA County and San Francisco and you know not just in Alabama far away hated them or didn't think mm -hmm. they were fully human or didn't think they deserved the same rights they did and so these gay rights campaigners started going door to door in their own communities in California asking people how they felt about gay people i mean it's incredibly courageous by the way it feels much more 2008 than 2022 right. you know right. um and i want to be clear no one has to do this like it's it's a it's really above and beyond to go door to door to people you know who might hate you asking them why but some minority of gay rights activists decided they wanted to do right. this work so they did it right the same way some you know uh black activists on police violence or other issues you know may want to do this work and most people may say i do not want to go door to door talking to older white people about the police right, right. so you've got to do the work you want to do right particularly in a country where so many people are packing heat like do the work right. you want to do, you feel safe and comfortable doing. That said, these campaigners developed, starting in 2008, a process, a protocol, a formula that has since been refined and subject to peer-reviewed academic studies, where you go to the door and you do the following. You, you introduce yourself, you convey respect, you announce in some clear and honest way why you're there, what your stance on that issue is, Right. Transgender rights, uh, racial equality, uh, you know, immigration reform, whatever. And then you listen. And this is not hand out a flyer, 30 second canvassing. This is 30 to 40 minutes on the door canvassing. 30 to 40 minutes per wow. person. How do you feel about that issue? Why do you think that way about immigrants? Interesting. And then they say some terrible things sometimes, some bile Mm -hmm. And unlike modern call out culture, Twitter culture that we all participate in, frankly, mm -hmm. you just keep listening. You don't you don't you don't call it out when you hear it. There's time for that. You just you got any more bile? You got any more bile? Any bile after that? No. Bile is finite. It turns right. out people yeah, will, is. <laughs> like people they will get it out, out they'll of get, it. They'll get it out. Right. Yep. yep. And they feel better having gotten it out. It's, it's out. They've said they've said right. Yeah, particularly if they know that's your issue and they feel like they're they're, they're finally getting, getting to tell you to your face how they feel. And then the really interesting persuasion work starts. So then what you do is you say, do you know anybody who's an immigrant? And often people who have expressed a very anti-immigrant view, 
in general and in the abstract will tell you that they do their colleague or their gardener or their mm-hmm. brother-in-law. And then you ask them to so the people you just mentioned, do they share the characteristics of laziness or dishonesty or propensity to criminality that you just described it for the overall group? And of course, Michael, they will tell you many no. cases that no, 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 they don't. That's one of the, some of the best guy I ever met or that, you know, and, and you start to see people, it sounds simple, but you know, you start to see people crack. You can go on these videos on YouTube. I, I went and saw door to door in Arizona. You see people start to realize, oh, hold on. I'm, I'm in conflict with myself, right? As Beyonce says in her new album, I'm contradicted. Mm-hmm. And then if, that works or doesn't work, you move on to the next thing, which is even more interesting, which is you take this particular issue, immigrant rights, trans rights, whatever, and you universalize it almost into a kind of Hollywood version of a hero, the hero's version, a hero's journey version of that right. struggle. So trans rights is no longer trans rights. It's about, have you ever been treated badly because of things about yourself you can't control, right? So mm-hmm. now the, the trans part has been, removed or abstracted to kind of a universal human aspiration to be treated well, you know, regardless Regardless, of things you can't change. Right. And again, you see people do, I, 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 one of the most beautiful canvas things I saw was on a a video early in the, in the development of this process where a, you know, relatively young black woman is expressing quite horrific views about trans people in general and about her own niece who is transitioning or or has transitioned and the canvas on the door doesn't judge her just you know pulls that out and then says have you ever felt scorned you know because and and it's interesting she didn't actually go to gender or race which may have been like the obvious things you would expect watching that video she talked about coming to LA from some other place mm-hmm. and she got this job and in her job, everybody was like, you should go back to that other city you were from. Like, you're not, you're not like, you're not LA worthy. You're like, you're not an LA. Right. And, 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 and then the guy's like, how, how did that feel? And she's like, felt terrible. Felt total. I, I didn't do anything. I mean, I was just there doing my job. And then you just, it's amazing, Michael. You can, you can see this woman. It's, it's like, it's like, you know, it was like, She had no skin and you could just see the inner workings of her brain through the the transparent epidermis. You can just see her going, oh shit, I'm doing that to my niece. Mm -hmm. You see it. It was a beautiful thing. And she doesn't become a trans rights activist in in a minute. But (laughs) for the first time in that woman's life, she's like, oh, I'm not the person I think I am. I'm not standing up for the values I think I stand up for. She comes into that kind of conflict and with herself and what the person on the door is doing, the persuasion work of deep canvassing is not to implant some opinion in you, Mm -hmm. some of one of my opinions in you, like some little microchip, right? And if you've ever been married, you know, that doesn't work anyway. (laughs) No, it doesn't work. (laughs) No. Uh, What you can do, I can't replace what you think. I can displace what you think. Right. I can make you go from no questions to having some questions. Right. I can plant doubt. And the way you do that is by playing up some things already going on in you against some other things, more dominant things mm-hmm. that are going on in you and arming arming that slightly weaker side of yourself, that B side of your opinion. And that woman is is just one example of so many people in this country who have gone through deep canvassing and have just realized for themselves, my my things don't square and, I, and I, I actually want them to square and I need to resolve that tension. And very often they resolve it in ways that lead toward greater tolerance, greater understanding, uh, greater support for, for the dignity of all people. Wow, man. Um, it is, it, you're absolutely right that, that, part of the book really kind of breaks breaks it all open um in the sense that you really kind of when you're thinking about it and reading it you're sort of putting yourself in those shoes um and look i tell you honestly for me it's been a part of my own personal journey you know growing up in dc and um 
getting into politics, uh, kind of always being an outsider in the inside game of politics. Um, and it's how you sort of, and I like the way you, you, you said it sort of open, the mind opens itself up in a way that you begin to realize, oh, wow, I, I'm seeing things much more narrowly, but when I don't, I can see my, I, I'm, you know, I'm now including myself because this is what I'm doing. This is how I am. This is what I think or how I feel. This has happened to me. It's happened to someone I know. And a big part of, I think our current narrative uh, is around this idea of people not fully appreciating the very thing they're projecting on others begins with themselves. I, I no. think that is so true. And I, I think one of the things, one of the, the the organizers I spoke to involved in deep canvassing said to me is the process of op opinion formation is an extremely emotional process. And that sentence kind of stopped me in my tracks because mm -hmm. I don't know that most people working in politics on the pro-democracy side understand that. All right. I think they, I, my, my sense is the Democratic Party establishment in particular thinks about opinion formation as a cognitive right. process, right. A, a, a brain function, a, 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 you know, people, people sit down, they gather the facts and figures, and then they decide their stance on climate change. And it's so self-evident if you've ever met a person that like where people land on climate is very much an emotional process because what is climate, right? Like there's a lot of data, there's a lot of fact. What is climate? You are being told, we are all being told that the way we got used to living, our ideas of abundance, our ways of taking care of each other, our ways of spending time, the things we enjoy eating for a treat on our birthday. <laughs> no good anymore. No, no bueno. God. It's no killing bueno. us. It's killing us. <laughs> it's killing. Right. And so you know, and the again, like the right totally understands that. So it's very easy for the right to be like, they want to take beef away from you. Right, right. right. Like, and that's totally messed and, up because like it's, it's cow just, farts. Why are you getting so exercised it, about cows right. farting in a like, field? And it's so dumb. And the agenda is 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 a dystopian one because it's going to it's going to tend in the direction of losing the planet. But what the right is doing there is insightful in that it understands that the process by which people are going to form a stand on climate change is an emotional process. So as what the right does is it intervenes emotionally at the level of emotions right. in an emotional process. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and what is the left saying? The left is saying, you know, uh, we got to reduce things by 1.5 Celsius <laughs> within 20 years and we can do credits to do the, it, Like, <laughs> have you ever met people? <laughs> like, I just, I don't, I don't understand, like at some very deep level, <laughs> And I'm not making myself out to be, you know, someone who's like living out in the streets. No, like, no. But I'm a reporter. I like talk to, I like talk to people at all levels of life. You know, like, have you ever met people? Like, have you, like, have you ever met someone moved by a credit that will only be materialize in a few years? Like, like, talk to me about my relationship to the earth. Like, talk to me about actually how we're gonna have like flying blimps and incredible free transit and like, like. Make me thrilled by right, this opportunity yeah. right, to build a right, really right. cool world, right? Like there's just this total failure to recognize human beings as like emotional first. And if if this book, The Persuaders is trying to do anything, it is trying to reorient the pro-democracy side to start with how people are and then build a politics on top of it. And there it is. And there it is. Uh, and I think I think you've done a, a wonderful job of doing that. And uh, I, I, I really encourage folks uh, to go out, grab yourself a copy of The Persuaders, uh, because it it is it's not what you think it is. Right. And what you're going to find is you're going to see a lot of yourself in the book and you're going to see a lot of things that you thought you disagreed with. Yeah, you're gonna actually kind of agree with, and a lot of <laughs> things, a lot of things you thought you were down with, you're not gonna necessarily be down with, and that is the beginning of opening one's minds to what's not only true around them, but what's true within you. 
uh, about yourself. And that's some of the hardest reading there is when you've got to read yourself. And and I think, um, Anna, you've done a, a wonderful job of that, my friend, of getting us to sort of read a little bit about ourselves. The book is The Persuaders at the Front Lines of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and democracy, you go after all three of those in this book <laughs> um, in a very expressive way. Congratulations on it. And thanks, man, for just coming by and spending some time. And thank you. I really I, I enjoyed this conversation. And we, you know, we, we need to have more of these conversations across differences of philosophy and ideology. And I love that we could we could have this uh, this time and this common ground. Nah, I appreciate that very much. And and you and I have always been able to do that, which is what I appreciate about uh, spending time with you. Uh, hopefully, folks, you got that vibe as well. And again, the book is The Persuaders. Go pick it up. Um, it's, you know, it, it's one of those things that's kind of very different from what we've talked about on this podcast in the past. So that to me makes it exciting. Uh, so also check out... Um, on it on on Twitter, follow on Twitter at uh, Anand Wright, A N A N D Wright, W R I T E S, uh, and certainly check out the book. Until next time, uh, stay cool, stay loose. Uh, fall is here, baby. It's getting a little chilly outside, <laughs> right? It's getting a little chilly. So find you know find a little something to snuggle up with, a little hot toddy, if you know what I mean. Um, but uh, until next time, be well. Take care. <laughs>